spoils and ghouls. In this series, we're going to be taking a look at one of the most underrated artists of all time, in my opinion. While he's a well-known artist's artist, he's avoided lengthy runs on titles and eschewed higher-paying work on superheroes for more science fiction and adventure-oriented material throughout his career. While he might not be inordinately partial to the superhero genre, though, Michael Golden is without a doubt one of the most interesting, enigmatic, and influential artists of the half-past century in the medium, and this despite only having produced what amounts to a smattering of comics in a career spanning more than four decades at this point. Starting at Marvel and DC in the late 1970s before becoming a fan favorite and carving out a niche of his own as one of the most bitingly original illustrators to have ever worked in the field, with his groundbreaking runs on both the Micronauts and the Nom in the 1980s, Michael Golden has only ever done a handful of interviews during his entire career as well, and even many dedicated fans don't know much about the actual man behind the drawings or the stories surrounding the comics that made him a living legend. From his heights in the 1980s and early 90s as one of the most highly sought after cover artists in the industry, to his on again off again relationship with the industry and sudden disappearance, we're going to be taking a deep dive into the career of one of the most interesting men to have ever picked up the pen. So kick back for another tasty tidbit of tawdry industry trivia and a little tale I like to call Michael Golden, Patience is a Virtue. Remember, if you enjoy this video, do me a favor and hit that like button. Think about getting in the comments section below and letting me know if you really enjoy what you see. Make sure you hulk smash that subscribe button. If you feel like you're in a position to support the channel and help it grow, think about using the link in the description to sign up for my Patreon page, sign up for membership right here on YouTube, or pick up your very own jerk comic shirts like the ones you see on the screen. But now, let's get into it. Michael Golden was born in October of 1955, and from an early age, it was apparent that he wasn't just a gifted artist, but what a lot of people would refer to as a prodigy of sorts. While Golden is notoriously tight-lipped about his past, after tracking down his 8th grade art teacher and combing through the sparse bits of his past that he has spoken to in interviews over the years, an interestingly dichotomous picture has emerged. While he's only done a handful, Golden claims in nearly every interview he's ever done that he neither knew about comics or was influenced by them as a child. He has what seems like a pretty well-rehearsed story about how he didn't have ready access to them and he wasn't all that influenced by comic books, as well as the fact that he was completely unaware of who was doing them. He makes it clear he's not really a fan of the medium and that he just happened to get into the industry by chance. That is, most of the time. However, in his first published interview in 1979, an interview for the Wizard fanzine, Golden specifically spoke to his love of Jim Storanko, saying that once he saw Strange Tales 159 in particular when he was in 6th grade, he knew he wanted to make comics. The Wizard interview reads a lot more like you would expect an interview with someone who makes comics to read than any other piece with Michael Golden you're going to find out there. While Golden certainly doesn't come off like some sort of gushing fanboy, he doesn't come off as jaded, cynical, or dismissive of the industry either. All things that could easily be used to describe a lot of his later interviews. In contemporary interviews, Golden says that most of his exposure to comics came through books like Little Lulu and Tintin, as well as a host of Disney books, which were all you would come across in secondhand shops where he found most of his comic books. Golden says that he had so little exposure to comics that he wasn't even really aware of who Jack Kirby was until years later. While he might not have been intimately familiar with Jack Kirby, being completely ignorant of his work would have been a virtual impossibility if you were reading titles like Strange Tales in August of 1967. Also, considering how much Storanko worshipped Jack Kirby, and given the fact that Jim Storanko's name is the only one that Golden brings up in the 1979 interview, this seems doubly strange. While I don't think this is necessarily a case of Golden trying to outright lie or anything, even as a child, Golden described himself as a quote-unquote 
storyteller. He was prone to exaggeration and regularly got in trouble for making up tall tales, and I think that's what's going on here. No one operates entirely in a vacuum, no matter how hard they try, but it sounds way better when you say it when you're completely self-taught and everything you're doing is absolutely and totally original, coming from yourself and nowhere else. Golden is bitingly original and obviously had no interest in stealing anyone's style, and given how he actually ended up getting into the industry, which admittedly is a seriously badass and interesting story that we'll get to here in just a second, this bit of exaggeration seems a little bit unnecessary, though. As I mentioned, I actually ended up speaking with Golden's 8th grade honors art teacher. He confirmed that even at that age, Golden was most definitely not only something of a prodigy, but by this point he also already had an incredibly impressive command of the human anatomy and the physical form. This is likely due to what Golden refers to as his associative memory. Where some people are blessed with what's commonly referred to as a photographic memory and are able to recall a nearly perfect image of anything that they've seen, Golden's mind apparently works slightly similarly, but on a completely different level. When studying Golden, it becomes clear that he is absolutely obsessed with how things work, how they fit together. From an artistic perspective, this is because once he's seen something and figured out the basics of what makes it work in our physical world and what makes it recognizable as what it is, he can not only photographically recall it, but he can also manipulate that image in his head, extrapolating how something would look from any angle that he could possibly conceive of. It sounds like some sort of weird parlor trick, and I have to admit to kind of thinking that Michael Golden was full of crap when I first heard him talking about this so-called associative memory. After talking to his art teacher and the more research that I did, the more apparent it became that Golden is telling the truth here, I think, though. It's incredibly interesting to hear him talk about art once you understand where he's coming from and how his mind works. And I think this facet of his personality has played inordinately heavily into not only his art, but his career as well. Back in 8th grade, this associative memory meant that while Golden already had an impressive understanding of the human form as well as how to intelligently and in most cases correctly manipulate the shapes that it was comprised of, he didn't necessarily have a firm grasp on translating his comic book oriented line based artwork into more three-dimensional looking drawings through the use of shadows and varied line weights though. While these were actually things that Golden would still be struggling with when he entered the comic book field in the 1970s, I don't think he ever had much impetus outside of these classes to work on these elements until he started doing sequential storytelling. Strong-willed and bored by most of the assignments that were being given, even in 8th grade, Golden was not the easiest to reach or to get along with, and it took a lot of trying on Bern Miller, his teacher's part, to make a connection. When he did, he said that the two got along pretty well because he understood that Golden needed a little bit of extra attention and extra space to creatively operate under. Unfortunately, I don't think that all of Michael Golden's teachers going forward shared this same kind of progressive interest and understanding, though. Around this time during his youth, Golden was also introduced to two other important factors that I think played pretty heavily into his evolution as an artist as well as the interests that he would hold for the rest of his life. While Golden says that he had little access to comics, he discovered a box of vintage pulp magazines in his uncle's attic that radically altered his tastes around this period. Along with a newfound appreciation of the works of Robert E. Howard and H.P. Lovecraft, these pulps also led him to science fiction and eventually, and perhaps most importantly, The Lord of the Rings. Upon discovering Tolkien's work, Golden quickly became enamored with the world building and the storytelling, and he has said that at one point he memorized almost the entirety of Lord of the Rings. As well as a newfound interest in science fiction and fantasy, Golden found himself drawn to the works of Charles Dickens as well. In fact, while Golden interestingly claims that he has no traditional influences on his art, he does cite Dickens as one of the few influences on his work in general. 
Dickens shaped the way that he sees and tells a story, and this is incredibly important for Michael Golden, who doesn't see himself as an artist per se, but as a storyteller. According to Golden, not only is Dickens a masterful storyteller, but the way that he handles characters is unlike anyone else. Dickens constructs his story with a defined beginning, middle, and end, but allows the characters to naturally progress the story and lead the reader organically through it rather than heavy-handedly forcing a plot or shoehorning needless material into the work. In other words, for Michael Golden, everything that Dickens does with his writing is in the service of a clear, concise, and intelligent storytelling process. Dickens' work and the way that he approached his writing deeply impacted Michael Golden and did so from an extremely early age. While he's never directly spoken to the exact reasons, his interest expanding, not feeling that he had much left to gain from a public education, Golden would soon drop out of school in order to go on what he refers to as a quote-unquote walkabout for the next several years. During this period, Golden traveled cross-country on his motorcycle, in his words, doing his best to avoid the Vietnam draft, which was still in full swing, and it was during these travels that Golden ended up using his art as a way to make money for the first time, covering random expenses incurred during his travels. Golden spent the next several years kind of unintentionally honing his artistic crafts while seeing the states on the back of his motorcycle. He began doing art at parties in exchange for things like food, a place to stay, or gas to get him to his next destination, although while obviously extremely gifted from an early age, Golden has always said that he has never really looked at himself as a very good artist, or as an artist at all for that matter as I mentioned. He always enjoyed making art, though, and despite his quibbling over word choices and definitions, Michael Golden has always known he is good at drawing. He just never thought it made him special or considered it as an actual career or skill. This despite the several years he spent providing for his living costs with art while on his walkabout. After several years on the road, Golden ended up having a pretty nasty motorcycle accident that he was apparently pretty lucky to walk away from. The Vietnam conflict had also come to an end around this time, and with no reason left to aimlessly wander the country, Golden found himself in Florida during the 1970s doing odd jobs, eventually working his way towards his journeyman's license as an electrician. While being an electrician was his major source of income, not only did Golden have a host of other manual and menial labor side jobs, including grocery store manager, truck driver, and construction worker, but Golden had also begun cashing in on the thriving commercial art boom that was taking place in Florida as well. Although he never set out looking for work or even got into the commercial art field period on purpose, much like how his art ended up paying for his expenses while on his walkabout, Golden was a naturally gifted person who caught the eye of people and especially business owners in desperate need of a host of artistic needs and happened into many of his initial forays into commercial design and illustrations as a result. As the rise of the mall culture began before long, without even realizing it, Golden was making a fair amount of money designing and painting signs and window displays for local businesses along the boardwalk and expanding his efforts rather quickly. With the birth of the mall, there were more and more local shops and stores that needed work, and impressed by the work that he did for others, there were a lot of people hitting Golden up about doing this kind of stuff. While he spent a great deal of his spare time doing commercial art, and despite it being something of a newfound revenue stream, and a decent one at that according to him, Golden says he still didn't see art as a viable way to make a living or even necessarily take it very seriously. Despite this, as the malls around him continued to grow and expand and his work there was in more demand than ever, Michael Golden also just so happened to be living right off of the beach. Here, there was a thriving counterculture during the early 1970s, to say the least, and Golden quickly found himself another source of art revenue and work.
Golden services were in pretty steady demand along the boardwalk, doing similar stuff as with the malls, with window displays and murals and that kind of thing. However, people also began asking him for custom t-shirts, and before long, he graduated from that to designing graphics for skateboards and surfboards as well. When Golden initially began doing them, he was simply painting the designs in acrylic onto the boards themselves with a brush. This does not work very well as the paint is difficult to apply and the designs quickly wear off. Golden was subsequently asked by a customer to do a mural, which then led to a van job that Golden was able to negotiate getting an airbrush machine to do. And then when he was finished with that, he was allowed to keep it when the jobs were over as part of his payment. He then used the new airbrush to step up his game and start doing more professional looking and longer lasting surfboards, skateboards, and t-shirts. It was this kind of forward-looking attitude, as well as his knack for bartering and a series of fortuitous events in the face of his not taking the arts extremely seriously, that would manage to keep him involved with them long enough for someone to eventually basically come along and drag him kicking and screaming into the comics industry a short while later by most accounts. Even though by his own admission, Michael Golden was making a halfway decent living off of his commercial art at this point, and despite several people, including friends, telling him that he should be doing something more with his art, Golden still just could not wrap his head around it. Art was something that he was doing for fun. He was good at it, but it was just something that he did in his quote unquote spare time. Even though, according to his own accounts, Golden had all but stopped drawing for fun and was mostly just doing commercial work and random illustrations for different people who sought him out by this point. While a few people were apparently pretty vocal about it for one reason or another, there was a particular friend of a friend who was insistent, telling Michael Golden that his style was perfect for comic strips or books. Not only did this friend of a friend think that Michael Golden was an amazing artist and that he should try his hand at comics, but it happened that she actually knew someone who worked at Marvel and could get Golden's portfolio in front of people. If he wanted her to, that was. While Golden has always maintained in interviews over the years that he just quote unquote didn't want to make the effort and wasn't super interested in getting into comics, I do know that someone submitted his portfolio to Marvel, DC, and continuity in the mid-1970s. While I obviously can't say for sure that this was Golden, while there were people pushing him pretty heavily to give the industry a shot, I don't think any of them took it upon themselves to send his portfolio into Marvel or DC or continuity and get it reviewed for him without telling him. Again, I think in large part because of the amazing story involving how Golden actually ended up getting work in the field, I think that he just likes to kind of conveniently leave this little bit out as it kind of undermines the wow factor a little bit, and I swear you'll understand what I'm talking about here in just one second. When Golden's portfolio was initially sent in, apparently both Marvel and DC told him that while he was definitely talented, they didn't see what he was doing as commercially viable. I've never seen this early portfolio, and there's a good reason for this, but while Michael Golden still had a lot to learn about producing art for comics, there was definitely still something there. Rather than give him the brush off or anything, Marvel instead told him to draw more like Jack Kirby, and DC implied that he should draw more like Neil Adams to secure work with them. Funnily enough, Neil Adams at his newly formed continuity actually ended up being the last person to see Michael Golden's portfolio as well as the reason that no one else has seen it since. While Adams remembers being fairly impressed, he also managed to permanently lose the portfolio somewhere in the continuity offices as far as I'm aware. While he might have lost the portfolio, Adams was definitely impressed with what he saw though and would periodically pester Michael Golden about coming to continuity in New York for a meeting so that they could talk face to face and he could see more of Golden's work. It would be a while before Michael Golden took Adams up on his offer and after the loss of his portfolio, but now armed with the feedback to work with from both Marvel and DC, who had been fairly reassuring, Golden completely overhauled this old portfolio. While Golden did some other stuff, obviously, he says that in his own words, 
the big thing he did was essentially lift an entire Neil Adams Batman story, copying it beat for beat while trying to tweak the story and art a little bit to make it more his own. I, however, don't know of Golden ever resubmitting this revised portfolio at the time he completed it, however. Despite the fact that Michael Golden did update his portfolio according to the feedback he got and was obviously drawing comic book material, I think it's safe to say he's definitely not exaggerating when he says that if it wasn't for a couple of other people, he never would have gotten into the industry. For the most part, this seems like because he just couldn't be bothered, whether this was a lack of interest or whatever. Regardless, Golden did obviously end up in comics eventually, and the story of how that happened is something of a legendary tale in and of itself, and I've alluded to it enough times throughout this piece already, so let's just get to it. It's not just how he got hired, though. Even Golden's initial exodus to New York is something of an interesting story unto itself, actually. As I mentioned, Michael Golden was actually working several jobs, including electrician and grocery store manager on top of random handyman positions at this point, and as always was also doing a bunch of commercial art jobs on top of this as well. While a great deal of Golden's art and design work was return customers, his commercial work put him in contact with a good number of people, and apparently there was a growing number of these people, including several clients that were really interested in getting Golden involved with either comic strips or comic books, as they believed that his art was perfect for them for one reason or another. Golden was slightly perplexed and couldn't really be bothered to take any of it seriously, though, and he certainly wasn't taking it seriously enough to apply for anything, even after Golden did this Lord of the Rings triptych illustration for a local shop, who were blown away by it. The owner said that they also knew people in the industry who they could call up and get to check out his work, urging Golden to give comics a shot once again. Still hesitant. Michael Golden declined to take them up on their offer, and it was essentially only because one man eventually told him to just shut up and go to New York and shoved a plane ticket into his hand that Michael Golden even made a concerted attempt to get into comic books. Golden had designed a series of brochures for this guy's company a while before, and he wound up redoing his roof later on as well. Golden was just working random jobs, trying to make ends meet, and I think that there were more than a few people who knew how talented he was, and that he was kind of wasting his talents with all of this manual labor job crap. Golden is, however, like many other artists, in the fact that they're not necessarily the most driven people in this regard, and often just kind of seem to take what comes to them by chance in a lot of cases. In these cases, it almost always requires the interference of an outside influence to somehow shock them to their senses, or in Michael Golden's case, literally hand them an opportunity. So impressed with Golden and feeling that he was wasting himself doing roofing, Golden's client believed in him to the extent that when Golden was done, the guy shoved a plane ticket to New York into his hand and told him to go and at least give it a shot and see what happened. You might think he would leap at this opportunity, but it honestly doesn't seem like Michael Golden was struck rather profoundly by the idea, even at this point. On top of this, though, as if a free plane ticket wasn't enough, it also happened that his client had friends who lived in Brooklyn, and they were happy to let Golden stay with them for a few days while he was in the city. Usually an extremely busy guy, Michael Golden says he just so happened to have a break in his schedule as he was between jobs at that point and as hesitant as he might have been, it was a difficult offer to turn down and eventually Golden finally relented, boarding the flight that would change his life as well as those of a lot of comics fans and professionals forever, that day in 1976. I think that Michael Golden was born to draw comics in a lot of ways, and while almost unbelievable the story of how he got his first work once he arrived in New York goes a long way in reinforcing this. Now, while I cannot necessarily confirm the exact times here, I can say that the dates line up and that by all accounts, Michael Golden wasn't in New York any longer than three days, maybe four days tops at some point in 1976. I see no reason why his accounts of the details that follow 
are not true. Although when I started this piece, I thought that they might have been slightly exaggerated to say the least. I actually kind of doubt that at this point. While there's some stuff I think Golden says that is a little amped up for the entertainment of the listener, I don't think that this is the case here, which is actually kind of nuts. According to Michael Golden, when he got to New York armed with his revised portfolio, he quickly set up meetings with his connections in town. The first place he visited was DC Comics, where he had an in via one of the friends of a friend, and they introduced him to a comics letterer named Denise Wall. She set up an appointment for him there around 10 a.m. in the morning. In this meeting, Michael Golden met with editor Debbie Shulman, who liked his stuff enough that she introduced him to none other than Vince Coletta, who was instantly impressed with Golden's work as well. After a little discussion, Coletta called in legendary comics figure Joe Orlando, who after reviewing Golden's portfolio, quickly assigned him his first couple of short stories for DC's horror anthologies, as well as several pinups, but it didn't stop there. Coletta also got fabled DC editor Julie Schwartz to check out Golden's stuff as well. Schwartz was confident enough with what he saw that he gave Golden his first Batman story right then and there. This means that Michael Golden left DC with not just one, but three story assignments on top of pinup work, including work on a Batman series in a matter of less than two hours without having so much as ever having set foot in the DC offices before that day. Unbelievably, Michael Golden then left the DC offices and went almost directly to the continuity offices for another meeting, this one with the inimitable Neil Adams around 12 o'clock that same day. Adams didn't have any work for Golden himself right at that moment, but he was even more impressed by the work that Golden had brought in than his original portfolio. This is especially funny because this portfolio reportedly contained a Batman story lifted almost entirely from Adams' own work by Golden's own description. Whether Adams noticed this or not, I've no clue, but I do know that he quickly made a phone call to Marvel and he set up a meeting for Golden to go and talk to them about getting work there instead. By 2 o'clock that afternoon, he had already visited DC and Continuity and Michael Golden was walking into the Marvel offices for a meeting with none other than the mirthful mistress of Marvel herself, Mary Severin. Severin took one look at Golden's work and ended up giving him a story on one of Marvel's horror anthology books as well. In less than six hours, while on a trip using a plane ticket that was given to him, staying for free with friends of friends who simply wanted to see him succeed, Michael Golden scored work for both major comic book publishers with essentially zero ends to the industry or previous experience. With several days to spare before his return home and plenty to do, Michael Golden reportedly went back to the apartment where he was crashing in Brooklyn, locked himself in what he referred to as the closet that they were letting him crash in, and immediately set to work on his first comic book assignments. Before he left to go back to Florida, he actually said that he stopped back by the DC offices to turn in some work that he had managed to complete. While Michael Golden's never concretely stated as much, this work would presumably be the pinups found in either one or both House of Secrets 148 and or 149. I think I should point out here as well, once Michael Golden sits down and actually starts drawing, I don't honestly think it takes him that inordinately long to pencil a page from start to finish. Getting to that point, however, can be difficult for this artist to say the least. While he claims it's a time and labor saving effort on his part, Golden does not do preliminary work on paper. He prefers to work mostly in his head, meticulously planning and laying out his pieces or illustrations before he ever even sets his pen or pencil to paper. While I actually think the drawing part comes kind of easy for Michael Golden, this element of conception does not. And getting to the point where he's actually putting something down can take him a great deal of time and effort as a result. While deadlines would obviously become something of a problem for Michael Golden as time went on, it's clear from DC taking him onto a big mainstay book like a Batman title right out of the gate 
that they not only had a lot of faith in his talent and the art that he was producing, but also his ability to produce that quality of art on a deadline as well. I also think that it's worth pointing out that the largest part of Golden's deadline problems on books would be for Marvel and not DC. I believe this is in no small part due to the completely different ways that the companies are run and in particular how they approach their release schedules. We'll talk more about it as we go, but Golden was perpetually behind on nearly every single Marvel book that he ever signed on for. While at DC, I didn't find a single story about him dropping the ball or missing a deadline on a major project aside from a single case decades after he entered the industry. After his trip to New York and now with assignments to complete, Michael Golden was actually offered another free place to stay, this time in New Jersey. Here Michael Golden holed up and finished work on his first Batman story, Target the Shotgun Sniper, as well as Hell of a Place and To Catch a God for House of Mysteries and Secrets of Haunted House for DC on top of The Pit and the Pendulum for Marvel Classics Comics as well. Once he finished his assignments and turned them in, based on the quality of the work, Michael Golden says the DC made it abundantly clear that full-time employment was waiting on him if he wanted it. In the face of getting work from not only Marvel, but DC, as well as praise from Neil Adams and the offer of ongoing monthly work for DC, Golden made plans for his return to Florida and his normal life. Golden says that while he enjoyed the work, he was still having a difficult time seeing art as a way to make a living and just did not want to give up on his electrician journeyman's license either. In fact, if it weren't for the strange weather that year in Florida, Michael Golden might have just done these few stories, lived out a childhood fantasy, and then gone back to his normal life without ever even blinking an eye. Thankfully for all of us, things didn't quite work out that way. Anyone familiar with Florida knows that it's famous in large part for its temperate climate and hospitable conditions. The winter of 1976, however, was a little bit different. While far from subarctic, it apparently snowed a great deal and Golden, still working as an electrician, not only found himself outside a great deal, but totally unprepared for this. Golden ended up getting minor frostbite in his hands that winter, and by chance, Julie Schwartz called him up to offer him an ongoing monthly backup in Batman if he wanted it. While he might not have been enamored with comics like a lot of people that get into the industry, Michael Golden was not stupid either. This wasn't just some offer for a random assignment on a horror anthology book that was being used as a tryout for newcomers. This was a shot at one of the major properties right away, and he knew he'd be crazy to turn down the work, saying that he'd enjoy the comic book work more than being an electrician anyways, and perhaps owing more than a little bit to the frostbite he'd recently suffered, knowing he would regret turning the opportunity down, Michael Golden packed his bags, headed for New York, and decided from that point on, comics was how he was going to pay the bills for however long it lasted. While Marvel would be the first to publish the work that he submitted in August of 1977, Golden quickly came to work almost exclusively with DC when he initially entered the industry. He released several short stories such as The Power Principle, Hell of a Place, and Hair Today Gone Tomorrow for several of DC's horror anthologies, but as promised was also being regularly featured in the Batman family backup starting with issue 15 in December of 1977, Following Target the Shotgun Sniper with the adventures of Houdini Whodunit and There's a Demon Born Every Minute. While his work on House of Secrets and The Witching Hour was just as good, it was his Batman work that would earn Golden an almost instantaneous reputation in the industry. In retrospect, this might have been a little irksome to Golden, however, who I think would have greatly preferred to be known for the quality of his work and not necessarily an association with a character that he'd worked on. It probably also didn't help that Michael Golden truly does not like working on superhero books, as I have mentioned and will continue to mention. It's not that he thinks that they're below him or anything, but he's not familiar with the characters, and his tastes have always lay more in action, adventure, science fiction. It's If you look at the au of his work, it's just obvious. 
For a guy who admittedly didn't care for comics that much to begin with, and like superheroes even less, Michael Golden's work on the Batman Family book is pretty incredible, especially for someone just coming onto the scene. For his part, however, Michael Golden has said that much of that early work was simply him aping what he thought worked well about Neil Adams' work, and he owes a great deal more to Adams rather than himself at this level. While this is in part because Golden respects Adams' work deeply, saying that he's nowhere near the artist or draftsman that Adams is, he was also pretty heavily pushed in this direction apparently. Why Michael Golden has said that it wasn't nearly as bad at DC as it was at Marvel concerning a house style, Golden confirmed he was pushed to make his work more commercial and accessible by studying Neil Adams' work. At a certain point, he felt like he was basically just being told to draw like Neil Adams, however, which to be fair, he did. Luckily for Golden and the rest of us, I don't think that he had it in him to simply kowtow and become another Neil Adams clone, though. Golden, like his friend Bill Sienkiewicz, instead began to identify and hone in on what made Neil Adams' drawings work so well and integrated that into his own unique style rather than just trying to copy, clone, or replicate Neil Adams' drawings. Unlike Sienkiewicz, though, Golden doesn't have a fine arts background and didn't possess a great deal of knowledge when it came to the actual products that he was producing art for. One of the major obstacles that Michael Golden faced when entering the industry was that he was completely unaware of how a comic book was put together, and while he would almost immediately be expected to learn how to do everything from letter to ink to color a page, Michael Golden didn't have a clue how those kind of things worked in relation to comic books or the printing process. You lost a lot of detail in comic book reproduction, especially back in the days of CMYK coloring and newsprint paper floppies, and you had to be really conscious of your line work. You had to be painfully aware of how colors worked and how they were printed on pages and how they were going to interact with your line work. You needed to be aware of what was and wasn't going to make it to the published page from your original art for a vast number of reasons. And Michael Golden was entirely unaware of all of this. Golden is a quick study though, and as well as obsessed with figuring out how things work and fit together and would have caught on eventually, but lucky for him, he was teamed with two incredible artists, in particular fairly early on in his career that opened his eyes to how you made proper comic book art and taught him the ropes and kind of what he was doing in general. While I definitely wouldn't say that Michael Golden is critical or even necessarily looks down on other comic book artists per se, it's not easy to find something nice that he has to say about a lot of other guys in the industry either, especially people that he's worked with. To a large degree, I believe this is because Michael Golden holds himself to an extremely high standard, and therefore he expects a lot from the people around him, many of whom are basically there to collect a paycheck and put in as little effort as possible when it comes to producing just another product for just another company as they see it. While this means that Michael Golden is often frustrated or disappointed with those around him, there are two guys that Michael Golden had nothing but good things to say about and seemed to have taught him a ton when it came to making reproducible, readable, and attractive art for comics, at one point quipping that he'd quote, never worked with a good anchor, but has had the pleasure of having several amazing artists ink his work. The first of these artists is none other than the legendary P. Craig Russell. Russell showed Golden what lines needed to look like for comic book reproduction at the time, as well as how to properly translate his pencils into finished inks. Golden and Russell were first teamed on the story The Monstrosity Case in June of 1978 and followed that collaboration with The Tomb of the White Bat in August of that same year. Famous for his own unorthodox approach to art and unique eye, Russell played an important part in the beginnings of Michael Golden's evolution as a true comic book artist. Up to that point, Michael Golden says that his work had been essentially flat contour drawings which were much more appropriate for animation than comics. 
While his flat lines and straightforward approach to line work were acceptable for a number of commercial applications, they made his early comic book work seem kind of boring in certain regards. This was something that he had dealt with when he was younger and apparently had never fully addressed. As soon as it became necessary and Russell showed Golden what line weight variations alone could achieve and how to really construct something for the printed page, things began to change and evolve for Golden, who was like a sponge, absorbing all these little parts and pieces from everything and everyone around him to develop a style and approach almost entirely all his own. P. Craig Russell was the first person to truly open up Michael Golden's eyes as to what was missing in his comic book work. He showed Golden how to make things more interesting, how to make them more dynamic, as well as a great deal about line reproduction. Not long after this, however, Golden was partnered with Russ Heath, the second man who would help to radically redefine the young artist's work on a story, Doom Unto Others, published in Mr. Miracle No. 25, which was released in August of 1978. Russell had shown him what needed to be changed about his lines and how to begin approaching that, but apparently Russ Heath did all of his own work with a brush. Because of this, he was able to achieve nearly the same results as Russell, but in only a fraction of the time, something that greatly appealed to the young Michael Golden, who was always conscious of only having so many hours of drawing in him and not wanting to work any longer or harder than he had to in order to achieve what he saw as a quality story or illustration that both he and his client were happy with. While working with a brush takes a great deal more practice than using pens, Golden says that when he saw what Russ Heath was capable of, he basically tossed out most of his other drawing tools and never looked back. Up until this point, Golden says he had been using a host of different drawing tools and techniques, including a great deal of pens like rapidographs and that kind of thing. If you look at Michael Golden's work prior to these three jobs and then examine it following them, there is a definite progression beginning to take place. While it's still a far cry from the Michael Golden that I think comes to mind for a lot of people, there were a ton of tricks and compositional elements that he did pick up during these three stories in particular that you would see repeated and become part of the more recognizable and refined art that we become so synonymous with his name, as well as incredibly popular only a few short years later during the 1980s and 90s. Along with his Batman stories, as I mentioned, Michael Golden had started work on Mr. Miracle with issue 23, released in April of 1978. While the series wasn't doing all that well, people were responding well enough to Golden's art on the series, and he seems to have enjoyed it largely due to the fact it was more science fiction based, and like Batman, not really a superhero book in the more traditional sense, at least not in Michael Golden's head. While the series wasn't doing inordinately well, following the release of Mr. Miracle 25, Golden was apparently set to take over as the regular monthly artist on the series for the foreseeable future. Golden actually had issue 26 entirely penciled and turned in and was in the process of working on issue 27 when word came down that the series was getting the axe. While the cover for issue 26 would see print shortly thereafter in Cancelled Comics Cavalcade 2, the interiors have never been seen and are likely lost to time at this point. This was the first, but sadly, certainly not the last time that work from Michael Golden would find its way into a drawer, which would become an all too common occurrence for the talented creator. According to Golden, while he was generally aware of who Jack Kirby was prior to working on the series, Mr. Miracle was important because it was the first time he was exposed to or analyzed Kirby on any kind of actual level. He began examining and dissecting Kirby's anatomy and how he worked with the human form. Eventually, Golden was able to take a lot of this stuff and begin interpolating it into his own work, although not nearly enough for some people's tastes, apparently. Also, while Mr. Miracle was a step down in the relative popularity ladder from Batman, who isn't just one of DC's biggest heroes, but one of the largest pop culture creations on the planet, 
Michael Golden said he was fine with taking over Mr. Miracle because the book allowed him to step even further out of the superhero genre to a much larger degree. Golden says that while Marshall Rogers was writing all of his normal stuff for the other titles and doing all these weird and wonderful man bat backups for Golden, which he loved, he was never going to get a monthly ongoing title like that, which he saw as the only way to make a sustainable living in the industry at the time. Mr. Miracle was really more of a sci-fi book at its core to begin with, and kind of a bizarre one at that. It was especially strange at this time dealing with all of these metaphysical and moral dilemmas as the weird and wonderful Steve Gerber had taken over the book and, as was often the case, taken it in an entirely different direction. In a lot of ways, Mr. Miracle was kind of like the antithesis of a superhero book, poking fun at a lot of the cliches and tropes that made up comics of the day. This was something that Michael Golden could get behind in a very real way. While he feels like the genre has changed and evolved somewhat over the years, he's always avoided superhero comics because of the tropes and traps that you fall into with that type of storytelling, which Golden says was especially bad at this point in the 1980s. Golden says of the superhero genre and storytelling of the day, it was, quote, unique to itself, and it had its own metaphors. It had its own way of telling the stories. The characters were just soap opera. They were bombastic. They were meant to be over the top, and the only writers and artists that did it well were the ones that understood that which Golden admittedly did not. He didn't get superhero books. He wasn't interested in superhero books, and I don't know if he would have been able to tackle an actual monthly superhero book at this point. Thankfully, this was simply the start of Golden beginning to carve out his own particular niche in the industry, skirting just around the edges of what was popular and acceptable to the mainstream readers of the big two. When he was working on superhero books, even big ones like Batman, Golden never seemed afraid to push the envelope, though, and several months after the cancellation of Mr. Miracle in 1979, Michael Golden would have another important Batman story, showcasing his growing artistic repertoire published titled Batmite New York Adventure. Batmite's New York Adventure is a particular note because it was the first time that Golden was allowed to really showcase his cartooning and character skills in the pages of a comic book, providing a number of illustrations of members of the then-current DC bullpen staff that are absolutely priceless. While this cartoony work was a pretty radical departure from the more realistic work that he was quickly becoming known for, it wasn't difficult for Golden because, yep, you guessed it, he'd actually worked as a character artist. At some point, you have to begin wondering what this guy hadn't done for work. Anyway, Golden's work on Batmite's New York Adventure was different, and while the trend in comics was more towards realistic approaches to art, and that story didn't blow up with fans, it was just what one of Golden's co-workers had been looking for. Batmite's New York Adventure happened to catch the eye of another DC employee at the time who approached Michael Golden about some possible designs and illustration work for a pitch that he was working on at the time, a man who would become an integral part of the next several decades of Golden's career and life and play an integral part in keeping him involved with the industry in general, a man named Larry Hama. Larry Hama, who was by then an up-and-coming DC artist, was working on the proposal and designs for a series that he was calling Bucky Bunny at the time. As always, when Hama offered him the work, looking for any excuse that he could find to avoid superheroes, Golden readily agreed to help. From their initial conversations and the way that Hama pitched him on the series, Michael Golden envisioned Bucky Bunny as an adult-oriented action-adventure science fiction piece more in the vein of underground comics like the works of Robert Crumb and his contemporaries than what it would later transmogrify into. Larry Hama, who had already done a fair amount of work on the series, gave Golden the designs and concepts that he'd already come up with, and together they set out to create a proposal that would wow DC out of their seeming ambivalence. Hama and Golden did a fair amount of work on the proposal while they were at DC, if I understand things correctly, over the next year or so, but DC kept dragging their feet when it came to committing to the series, and soon outside forces would intercede, knocking the project off course for the better part of the next half decade. 
The story of Bucky Bunny was far from over, however. Despite not being overly enthused with superheroes, reasoning it was more of a detective book than a cape and cowl thing, the Batman work was also steady and reliable work, and Golden planned to continue his monthly backup work on the Batman family books. Michael Golden was also a struggling artist, however, and in late 1978, at the Creation Convention in New York City, Michael Golden happened to approach Marvel editor Archie Goodwin about the possibility of doing a science fiction story for Marvel Comics. Golden had come up with what he thought was a pretty solid idea, but there wasn't really anywhere to put it at DC at the time. Not to mention DC was having some pretty serious financial problems by this point. Funnily enough, the actual story in question would go on to become Golden's legendary Star Wars fill-in issue after some reworking and a little bit of time. Jim Shooter, who was impressed with Golden's work and had been looking to get him to do something for Marvel for a while anyways, took the opportunity to approach Michael Golden and ask him if he would be interested in doing some work for Marvel. Offering $10 more a page which was either $28 or $32, depending on when Michael Golden is telling this story, and with the promise of steady work from Marvel on top of his monthly Batman backups, Golden agreed to his first real work with Marvel following the publication of two random issues of The Defenders that he'd done back in late 1977 while still getting his footing at DC. While career-defining, Golden's time with Marvel would not only be troubled, it would ultimately be the entire reason he would step away from interiors only a few short years later, almost completely abandoning the industry at that point. While DC was a pretty stiff corporate environment, and I don't know that Golden always fits super well into that cookie cutter mold like he was supposed to, they had a set way of handling things, and at least he could figure out what was going on and how things worked there. The move to Marvel was a rough one, not only because he didn't really fit in there either, but because it was so different from DC and the environment where he was coming from. At Marvel, there were no safety nets. Everyone seemed to be flying by the seat of their pants perpetually, and they were constantly up against absolutely unholy deadlines. This attitude, which he took as unprofessional and needless, led Golden to constantly and consistently using one word to describe Marvel. Chaos. And to be fair to Golden, especially when he was working there, I don't think that this was too far off. Marvel was full of big ideas and in some ways willing to take chances on some stuff that DC wasn't. However, as a result of the way that they were handling things and how Michael Golden himself would handle things, this is when Golden's deadline troubles would become notorious and he would quickly develop a reputation as being difficult to work with on top of that. As I've tried to point out, however, I think that much of these problems actually do fall back on Marvel and how they handle things rather than just Michael Golden, like most people would lead you to believe, and a lot of what was said about him being hard to deal with was greatly exaggerated. Initially, Golden was given small assignments, like a Logan's Run and an Iron Man story, both of which never actually saw publication at the time. While the Logan's Run story would eventually be reworked in 1981 for an issue of Bizarre Adventures and re-released as Huntsman, and the Iron Man story would eventually end up in Marvel fanfare even later, this was far from an isolated case, as I've mentioned. In fact, much of Golden's early work from Marvel would suffer a similar fate for a host of various reasons, sometimes sitting in drawers and desks for years at points, and others never even to be seen again. As frustrating as this is for fans, and I'm sure it had to be annoying on some level doing all that work and then never seeing anything out of it, but Marvel paid him. And given Golden's views and opinions on his art and work, which we'll talk about in a great deal more detail shortly, I don't know if Michael Golden ever actually gave it a second thought in most cases. While he was doing a fair amount of work for Marvel, as I mentioned, Golden had planned to continue his monthly work for DC on the Batman Family title following the cancellation of the monthly Mr. Miracle book and the loss of that promise of steady monthly pay. Unfortunately for Michael Golden, Mr. Miracle had just been a portent of things to come, and DC was in the midst of a major company-wide crisis, 
often referred to today as the DC implosion. The company was losing money hand over fist, and the only way to stop the bleeding was to amputate limbs, in corporate's opinion. DC started canceling books left and right, letting writers and artists go, and I don't know if they had planned to keep him on prior to this, but apparently when DC found out that Michael Golden was working with Marvel, he says they basically decided that he didn't need any more assignments from them since he had already found work elsewhere. Golden says he was never officially let go or fired from DC or anything, but when Golden's telephone stopped ringing and the monthly Batman work dried up, he knew it was time to jump ship, making the move to Marvel Comics full-time around February of 1979. When he joined Marvel full-time, he was approached almost immediately by Jim Shooter with the initial proposal for Micronauts, the series which, for better or worse, would go on to define Michael Golden, despite the fact he only did a dozen issues and spent less than a year on it. Still, fondly remembered enough by fans today to earn an IDW Artist Edition more than 30 years after its initial release, Micronauts was originally the brainchild of writer Bill Mantlo, but quickly became more of a collaborative effort once Golden came on board. The idea for Micronauts reportedly came to Bill Mantlo when he saw his stepson playing with some Micronauts toys that he bought him one Christmas morning in 1978. Obsessed with the possibilities that the interchangeable parts presented in his mind and believing that there was a lot of potential there, Mantlo approached Marvel with the prospect of creating a title for the Micronauts toy line. Where most of the toys that were licensed for comics at the time and in the future as well had a pre-existing world built around them and oftentimes even stories and origins already in place, Micronauts, on the other hand, was completely wide open to Bill Mantlo, who wanted to take advantage of this fact as much as he possibly could. Initial concept and pitch work design for the series was done by a guy named Bob Hall. Hall was apparently too busy with his passion project, no pun intended, the off-Broadway play The Passion of Dracula, and couldn't be bothered to finish up work on the series when the production started, though. After Bob Hall left the series, Marvel hoped that Jack Kirby, who is just about fed up with Marvel at this time, would come on board and do some work on the series. But as many had predicted, things with Kirby went totally sideways, and he didn't just end up not working on Micronauts, but leaving Marvel entirely not long after this. And if you want to learn more about that, make sure to check out my Jack Kirby Lord of Light documentary series, which I'll make sure to link in the description below. After Jack Kirby fell through, George Perez was apparently extremely interested in working on Micronauts and wanted to get involved. Because of his already insane schedule, he just wasn't able to make it work and had to back out of it as well, leaving Marvel back at square one, though. With their initial prospects totally spent, Jim Shooter had a rather clever idea. Golden had been talking to Archie Goodwin about doing a science fiction story for Marvel due to his distaste for the superhero genre when he ended up coming over to Marvel anyways. This is why Jim Shooter took the opportunity to pitch Michael Golden on the Micronauts so quickly, actually going so far as describing it as this sweeping science fiction space epic more in line with Star Wars than superhero books. Intrigued by the initial pitch, Golden, who was in the middle of a move to Virginia at the time and needed the work, agreed to do Micronauts completely unaware what was in store for him. Michael Golden says he knew, but I don't think he really understood what he could have been signing up for working on a licensed property, which can be a legendarily huge pain in the butt. Licensed books like this would not hit their full clip until a short while later, but this could have been an utterly painful experience just due to getting approval on art and that kind of thing. With both the toy's original Japanese producers, Takara, and the U.S. distributor, Migo, almost completely hands-off of the entire thing, though, Michael Golden and Bill Manlo were more or less allowed to do whatever they wanted within reason with the property. Nonetheless, Micronauts would unfortunately still prove to be a pretty hellish experience for Michael Golden and many others who were involved with the series, as there were a lot of difficulties with both editorial and behind-the-scenes infighting having to do with a host of different aspects of the book. The biggest obstacles that faced Bill Mantlo and Michael Golden was probably the series' biggest strength. 
The concept simply was not defined, especially not in any fashion that it would be acceptable for publication. Now, on top of this, Bob Hall's concept and design work was abandoned and half-finished. There wasn't even a unifying visual aesthetic that tied Micronauts together like a lot of the other toy lines that would follow as the 1980s progressed. Needless to say, there was a lot of work left to be done when Michael Golden agreed to take on Micronauts, but he was up to the challenge and perhaps even uniquely qualified for work on the series. Together, he and Mantlo not only refined the ideas that would more or less guide the first 12 issues, but came up with additional characters to help fill out the world as well. Golden ended up creating and designing both the characters Marionette and Bug for the comic. This could have been problematic given the legal logistics of having original Marvel creations inside of a book about toys licensed from Mego and owned by Takara. Apparently, this wasn't a big issue at all when he did it, though, and no one even batted an eye. This was for a few reasons, I guess. At the time, the insertion of original characters into a licensed property title wasn't viewed as nearly as problematically because reprints were not what they are today. A lot of people weren't thinking about the long-term ramifications of stuff like this because most material was simply never reprinted after the initial license ran out. By the time you let the license run out, printing books just wasn't profitable enough in anyone's eyes to relicense it to put more books out. Al Gordon also said that people were basically tripping over themselves trying to get a licensing deal with Marvel at the time. Having a comic book line to back up whatever you were doing was starting to become a more regular practice and would become almost a must by the middle of the decade. Due to the unique set of circumstances, the creative team were given an extreme amount of freedom when it came to Micronauts, allowing Marvel and Mantlo, as well as Michael Golden, to do what they wanted with the series without much fear of interference from anyone on the outside, although Michael Golden would have something to say about the direction that Jim Shooter and Bill Mantlo almost immediately started taking it once it started publication in January of 1979. The introduction of original characters has eventually caught up with both Marvel as well as Hasbro, who now owns the Micronauts license, though. Because Marvel owns the original characters from the comic book and Hasbro owns everyone else, reprints have to be approved by both companies, which has proven to be a monumental pain. After decades of being unavailable, for the first time since its publication in 1979, however, Micronauts is finally being collected in an omnibus edition by Marvel in 2024, and they even did a facsimile re-release of the first issue in September of 2023, proving just how popular this series is with fans to this day. Even at this, the solicitations for the omnibus say supplies will be limited, insinuating it's a rather tenuous one-off printing agreement between Marvel and Hasbro and that the Micronauts omnibus probably won't be in print for very long, much like the Micronauts Artist Edition, which despite extremely high demand, went out of print almost immediately. Still, the fact we're seeing it at all is kind of impressive, but I digress. While Bill Mantlo is the guy who came up with the idea to begin with, and Bob Hall had been the one who did the initial concept work, everyone involved with the project, including Bill Mantlo, who did not always see eye to eye with him about a lot of stuff, admits that Michael Golden was the one who really breathed life into the project. Quote, Michael took design concepts suggested by the toys and breathed cosmicity into them. I could provide ideas, suggestions, words, but Michael made Bug. He made Marionette. He made the Time Travelers and the HMS Endeavor and the Aqua Years. While Mantlo had a number of kind things to say about Michael Golden, I know that the two had a difficult time working together in many respects as well, and I'm not sure how mutual the feeling was. I do know that Michael Golden did not like working in the Marvel method of writing, though, nor did he care for the direction that Mantlo decided to take the series following its initial success to everyone's surprise. Despite Micronauts being extremely influential, as well as fondly remembered, behind the scenes, things were more than a little bit turbulent, and there were major problems with the series before it ever even launched. 
Golden, who was still in the middle of his move, had been sent a box of the toys and was using his associative memory to pretty quickly wrap his head around what was going on with their designs and concepts. He played with them, pulled them apart, and reassembled them in new configurations until he felt confident that he'd figured out how they worked and slowly began assembling work for what would become the first issue. Unfortunately, as was often the case when Golden worked with Marvel, there were either communication errors or, as Golden says repeatedly in interviews, he was given the old bait and switch, and they simply changed the terms of the deal after it was made, oftentimes without ever even telling him, which happened to be the case with Micronauts. According to Michael Golden, when he agreed to take on the book, it was with the understanding that he was in the middle of a move, and he wouldn't even have access to a telephone for several weeks. Michael Golden was told to take his time with the art, and he was assured that the series wouldn't be solicited or put onto the schedule until they had at least three issues in the bag. This would help the fledgling Golden keep up with the deadlines more easily, ensuring the book didn't fall behind schedule while still maintaining the quality of the art and the writing from issue to issue and hopefully eradicating the need for any fill-ins or anything. According to interviews with Michael Golden, this version of the agreement lasted exactly as long as it took him to get his phone hooked up, though. When Golden got his phone turned on, he says he basically immediately received a call from Marvel telling him that he needed to go and get to work on the book because he was several months behind schedule already. When Golden asked how this was even possible, since he was told they weren't going to put the book on the schedule until several issues had been completed, Marvel explained that apparently, without telling him, after some initial good responses to solicitations, they were going to be putting more push than initially anticipated behind the book, and in their infinite wisdom, had decided to stick Micronauts on the schedule despite Michael Golden not even having finished work on the first issue yet. This was irritating to Michael Golden, who is as meticulous a worker as they come, with all of his lead time gone in the blink of an eye and starting off months behind schedule before the first issue ever even launched, Golden gritted his teeth and set to work on the issue knowing that he would be constantly fighting the clock as long as he stayed on Micronauts. Having been promised time to really make the series shine, this did not make Michael Golden happy either. Quote, the entire run of the Micronauts was nothing more than making up the schedule, and I don't like to work that way. It compromises the project. If these complications before he ever even started drawing the first issue weren't bad enough, when he had submitted his pencils, Jim Shooter absolutely hit the roof. Jim Shooter said that the art wasn't up to snuff and that he couldn't make heads or tails of the story either. He demanded that not only a good deal of the art be entirely redone, but mandated the first of a plethora of story elements be changed as well. According to Michael Golden, this was the beginning of Jim Shooter systematically removing or replacing nearly all of the science fiction and adventure elements that he had used in order to sell Golden on the Micronauts to begin with. Shooter must have been pissed about the art because despite every single other issue that Michael Golden has ever worked on for the series featuring a cover by him, Shooter brought on longtime Marvel mainstay Dave Cockrum for the cover instead. This seems to further drive home just how much Shooter disliked the initial work that Michael Golden turned in, although it is entirely possible that Dave Cockrum was brought on simply because Micronauts was starting off behind schedule, and Dave Cockrum was a known quantity at Marvel as opposed to the newcomer Michael Golden. Jim Shooter may have thought that a cover from an established artist like Dave Cockrum was the best way to kick off the series, but... Considering that Michael Golden picked up cover starting with issue two and stuck around for several years, even after leaving interiors, not to mention just how much it seems like Jim Shooter disliked and wanted to change the series, I'm not entirely convinced that this is the case. Also, as an interesting side note, Marvel is using a Michael Golden piece for one of the variant covers to the upcoming Micronauts omnibus slated for release in 2024, as I mentioned. This image is being promoted as an unused, rejected Michael Golden cover for the first issue, 
Golden, however, argues that he never had any finished art rejected, arguing that he would have never gone that far on a piece without getting approval, especially something like a cover. Golden says that the image in question was never meant to be a cover, but was most likely a piece of unfinished promotional artwork that he reworked from some concept sketches that simply ended up never getting used. If this is the case, it seems to indicate Jim Shooter was so unhappy with Michael Golden's work, he didn't just reject a cover from him. He outright didn't ask him to do a cover to begin with, kind of again driving home how displeased he was with Micronauts in general and Michael Golden in particular when the series began. While there aren't a ton of details about exactly what was changed and how things were resolved, the first issue would be produced from quote unquote breakdowns by Michael Golden with quote unquote finishes by initial series anchor Joe Rubenstein. And while it might have passed muster for Jim Shooter, I don't think Michael Golden was any too happy about Rubenstein's finishes. While he only granted a single interview between 1979 and 1997, in the 1979 interview, Michael Golden didn't just say that he was unhappy with Rubenstein's work. He actually goes so far as to say that he doesn't like what anyone is doing on Micronauts. That is outside of legendary letterer Tom Orzakowski, who is just God-tier status. Come to think of it, I don't think I've ever heard of anyone complaining about Orzakowski, now that I think about it. Anyways, behind the scenes of Micronauts, there were mounting tensions between Michael Golden, who, as I said, has constantly said he's never worked with a single good inker in his entire career, and Joe Rubenstein, his inker, who wasn't happy on the series, to put it lightly. Obviously, not seeing eye to eye with Jim Shooter about how the series should look or even what it should be about by the time they got the first issue out, as well as things being constantly behind schedule simply because Marvel had decided to solicit the book without his knowledge or consent and in violation of their initial agreement, Michael Golden was growing increasingly frustrated and unhappy, not only with Micronauts, but Marvel and comic books in general. One good thing that did come out of Mark Renauds is that I believe this is how longtime Marvel alumni Al Milgram met and eventually became friends with Michael Golden while serving as editor on the series. Although he constantly butted heads with both Jim Shooter and Bill Mantlo, and it just doesn't feel like they got Michael Golden, Al Milgram would go on to become a mainstay in his career, much like Larry Hama, helping to keep Golden involved in the industry over the decades to whatever extent he was capable of at any given point. As time passed and he and Milgram grew closer, however, Golden began to complain more and more about how unhappy he was with numerous different aspects of the Micronauts book. In an attempt to keep him happy, Milgram eventually started allowing Golden to make more and more artistic changes and allowing him more control over the series, despite Jim Shooter obviously being less than enthused with what he was doing. In the face of Shooter's opposition, and probably in large part due to the creative leeway afforded to him by Al Milgram, Michael Golden did his absolute best to make Micronauts as good as he possibly could by systematically seizing control of aspects of different parts of the book before he left the series later on in 1979. While Michael Golden says that he ended up contributing to nearly every facet of the book in one fashion or another during his short stint on Micronauts, Michael Golden was apparently even doing the color guides for Micronauts himself at a certain point regularly because he felt like the coloring muddied his line work up and made things difficult to read. Golden was obviously something of a perfectionist and did not suffer those who were simply drifting along lightly. As a result, while he was allowed more control over different parts of the book, and I think Michael Golden was getting more comfortable with his art as well as how to handle Micronauts, he was growing increasingly weary of doing what he felt like should be other people's jobs simply because they couldn't be bothered to do it competently or correctly to begin with. Golden might come off a little callously in the 1979 interview, especially when it came to the work being done on Micronauts, and Golden has actually publicly chided himself about this, but Michael Golden was, however, far from alone in his thinking. While they had managed to get the first issue out, Jim Shooter was none too pleased with either Michael Golden's art 
or Joe Rubenstein's inks, and he attempted what he saw as corrective action almost immediately. According to Golden, he was told to, quote, draw like Kirby, draw like Kirby, draw like Kirby, over and over, to the point that after the first three issues, he just kind of, quote, unquote, gave up in his own words. There's a noticeable difference in line weights and approaches to composition as Golden tries to lean as hard as he possibly can into incorporating a number of attributes that made the King's work so distinctive into his own. Golden never really got to where Marvel wanted him, and I don't think that Jim Shooter was ever really happy with the work that he was doing on this series, however, but the fans, on the other hand, fell in love. As much as Jim Shooter might have disliked it, the fans felt like Golden's voice was a fresh and new one in comics, and Micronauts really cemented him as one of the preeminent artists of the period. Golden, however, felt pressured to draw in styles and ways that weren't his own, and as a result, the art for the first several issues especially is all over the place in a lot of regards. Done in order to appease Jim Shooter and Marvel editorial, these constant artistic shifts would not only bother Golden, but lead to some pretty major problems with Joe Rubenstein behind the scenes as well, actually. While Golden was being pushed to basically copy Jack Kirby's style, he tried to do what he'd done at DC when they expected him to emulate Neil Adams instead. Rather than just try and clone Jack Kirby outright, Golden analyzed and dissected his work. He identified what made it work and then tried to integrate those elements which he believed could be used to improve or add to his own already unique and distinctive style. While this had to be creatively stifling and frustrating to a certain extent, Golden has said that this time spent analyzing and picking apart Jack Kirby, who he had only ever really paid cursory attention to in these regards during his short time on Mr. Miracle, added a lot to his repertoire and style. Michael Golden also understood that being expected to produce material in a certain way, whether that be a house style or whatever, is a big part of producing commercial art. In fact, the way that Michael Golden describes his approach to the medium embraces a reality which many artists never seem to be able to get used to, let alone come to terms with if they do. Golden says that for him, the biggest part of a commercial job is making the person who hired you happy. This should obviously be done while also still doing the best job that you possibly can under the circumstances and the time constraints that you're operating under, but the main thing is making the client happy and getting paid. If they're happy and you got paid, you should be happy too. That being said, I do think that not being able to produce the best work that he possibly can bothers Michael Golden, like a lot, d d deeply especially when he doesn't perceive it as being his own fault, which was most certainly the case for Micronauts. Unfortunately, the constraints in this situation also happen to include a number of people on the series telling Michael Golden to draw differently and changes being made to his work. This in turn threw off Joe Rubenstein, who was absolutely butchering Michael Golden's work on Micronauts, in my opinion, although to be completely fair, I don't think this is necessarily all Rubenstein's fault again, and much of this falls back on Marvel. Golden had previously worked with Rubenstein on a Batman backup story, Private Eye Man Bat, in October of 1978 for Batman Family Issue 20, and he had been extremely happy with the inks on it. When he started getting pages back from Micronauts, Golden could not understand why Joe Rubenstein just seemed to be obliterating his pencils, though. And to be fair to Michael Golden, the inks on those issues do look rough, to say the least. Joe Rubenstein has said that there was a very good reason for this, though. Not only was Golden's art dramatically changing from issue to issue, but the Micronauts' work was nothing like what Michael Golden had been turning in for his early Batman material, which is obviously what Rubenstein had gone into Micronauts expecting stylistically. 
After continual deadline problems, as well as editorial prodding for changes in the art, this couldn't have been further from what ended up happening, though. You have to remember, Rubenstein was expected to complete the first issue entirely off of breakdowns by Michael Golden and kind of already know his style in this sense, which he clearly did not in the case of the Micronauts work. This, again, is not because Rubenstein is bad at his job or anything, but because of the perpetually changing nature of the work that Golden was producing on the series because of Marvel's mandate. Rubenstein has said in the interviews that just when he started to feel like he might be getting a feel for what Golden was doing, the art would suddenly change again and Jim Shooter was just breathing down his neck about getting stuff to look a certain way the entire time. Frustratingly, though, Rubenstein says that Shooter's wins seem to kind of change from issue to issue as well. This was annoying to say the least, and Rubenstein wound up leaving Micronauts to everyone's relief after only seven issues as a result of these repeated incidents with both Jim Shooter and Michael Golden. With the constant behind-the-scenes clashes between the creative talent and editorial, as well as Golden's public statements that he was displeased with everyone's work on Micronauts, except for Tom Orzakowski. What's kind of ironic and sad about this entire situation is that Michael Golden and Bill Mantlo had actually been allowed to handpick the team for Micronauts, which seems to have completely blown up in their faces. The problems with art notwithstanding, the real thing that would drive Golden to leave Micronauts after only such a short time, however, were the growing creative differences between he and Bill Mantlo that I've mentioned. Mantlo, along with Jim Shooter, seemed to be interested in taking Micronauts in the complete opposite direction that Golden was interested in and how he had been pitched on the series to begin with. Now, there aren't any notorious stories or anything that I can point to where Bill Mantlo and Michael Golden had it out or anything, but I think it's clear that they fundamentally saw Micronauts very differently. They obviously had diametrically opposing views on where the series should be heading and how it should be handled. Simply put, while they might have managed to get Micronauts out, they never saw eye to eye on how it should be drawn or plotted. This was an all too common problem for people who worked for Marvel during the heyday of the so-called Marvel method of writing. The writer could basically add whatever story and dialogue that they wanted after the artist was done, and unless the artist was plugged in with the editor or had some serious juice, there wasn't much that they could do about it after it happened. There are some pretty crazy stories of this going absolutely disastrously as well, the most famous of which I think being John Byrne's seemingly abrupt departure from Claremont's X-Men, which occurred because of a single panel that featured Colossus tearing a tree stump out of the ground. This obviously wasn't the whole story, and Byrne's departure from X-Men had been coming for a while if you were paying any attention. Much like with Byrne and Claremont, I believe that there was a lot of behind-the-scenes tension between Bill Mantlo and Michael Golden stemming from Mantlo's reliance on this style of writing. It should be pointed out that not only was this style of writing the norm at Marvel during this time, however, it seemed to be encouraged by Marvel in many cases. Again, this was due to the fact it was way easier to make revisions and editorial changes when the story hadn't even actually been written yet, and you could just do whatever you wanted with the dialogue and then stick it on the art. While I'm not aware of any particular cases where this necessarily took place on Micronauts that anyone has gone on record about, I do know that the one thing Michael Golden has brought up specifically and repeatedly in interviews is the fact that he felt taken advantage of and essentially lied to about the series. Golden says that Bill Mantlo had seemingly taken advantage of the month-long period where he didn't have a phone to make alterations to the Micronaut series following his involvement in the series, but completely without his knowledge or input. As it happened, Golden says that many of these story changes and editorial mandates that seem to be coming from out of nowhere from Jim Shooter, in which we're so radically changing and redefining Micronauts, 
were in actuality things that it turns out had been discussed and agreed upon between Bill Mantlo and Jim Shooter behind Michael Golden's back during this month-long period. Given where Mantlo and Shooter were ultimately interested in taking Micronauts and that they knew Golden would be oppositional to these points to say the least, I think that this was the beginning of the end of Micronauts, which is funny because it took place before the first issue ever even saw print. If it's not apparent by now, things on Micronauts were not going like anyone had planned. Despite this, the series was doing extremely well, especially with fans. And while some people at Marvel were more than a little mystified by fans' interest in the series, Michael Golden was quickly on his way to not only making a real name for himself in the industry, but turning Micronauts into a serious powerhouse unto itself. That is, until Michael Golden decided after about four months on the series that he was done. Golden was tired of constantly being behind schedule. The original science fiction adventure driven story that Shooter Mantlo had sold him on was systematically being culled from the book bit by bit. And most alarmingly to Michael Golden, Marvel had begun trying to drag the Micronauts into the Marvel Universe proper. While this was much to Bill Mantlo's delight, and likely much of what he and Shooter had discussed and agreed to change about the series during Michael Golden's month-long absence from the conversation about Micronauts, for Michael Golden, who had taken on Micronauts specifically to avoid having to deal with superheroes and mainline Marvel continuity, this was the final straw. According to Michael Golden, by the third or fourth issue, as the science fiction and adventure elements continued to dissolve, he was encountering perpetual problems with editorial, constantly being told to draw more like Jack Kirby, and he continued to fall further behind schedule with Micronauts. Despite all of this, he'd already decided that he wasn't going to be sticking around for much longer. When he went to talk to Jim Shooter and Bill Mantlo to see if he could work things out about his problems with the direction the series was taking, he was told that there were already set plans on how the Micronauts Microverse was going to be integrated into the Marvel Universe proper. The Microverse was going to be revealed as yet another of the countless alternate dimensions accessible by the usage of Pym particles, a substance created by Hank Pym, the first Ant-Man back in 1962 and often referenced in the pages of the Fantastic Four. Manlo and Jim Shooter planned to make the leap from a standalone licensed series to a fully integrated mainline Marvel continuity series starting with issue 7 and the inclusion of the Marvel character Man-Thing as well as the introduction of an actual superhero character, Captain Universe, in the next. When Golden protested, saying that it would completely undermine where the series was originally intended to go, he was told in no uncertain terms that things were already in motion. Bill Mantlo was obviously behind the idea in a big way, and when Jim Shooter wanted something to happen, it was going to happen, whether the creative talent liked it or not. Knowing full well there was no use in arguing, Golden in turn told them that he would stick around for a few more issues so that they could wrap up the current story arc that they were working on, but that there was no way he would be involved with Micronauts past issue 12, so they'd better wrap things up if they wanted him to draw it. While there's little doubt that the Man-Thing and Captain Universe issues were the straws that broke the camel's back, I think the truth is Michael Golden had lost interest in the series from almost the onset. Michael Golden says that for his part, the only real reason he stuck around on Micronauts for this long was a sort of badge of honor to prove to everyone, including himself, that he could bang out a decent book every two weeks under what he considered the most miserable deadline circumstances he could imagine. And he did, but Golden didn't even make it a year on Micronauts, and the tank was running dry even then. Micronauts had been an incredible learning experience, and Golden's art had quite literally transformed during his short stint on the book, skyrocketing Golden into the popular eye and making Micronauts a fan favorite title, but the writing was on the wall and had been for some time. 
Once Golden made it clear that he was going to be leaving the series with the fate of the book kind of up in the air, the decision was made to entirely rework the story to conclude the initial arc within the 12 issues that they knew Michael Golden would be available, while still leaving things open for a new artist to come on board and kick off a new storyline in completely different direction from Micronauts when they did. Again, how this all actually went down is apparently a matter of some great contention, however. Michael Golden says that Bill Mantlo had this massive but entirely unrefined idea that he originally saw as lasting something like 50 or 100 issues. Golden described it as a sprawling, massive worldscape, very much in the vein of Lord of the Rings, which would actually make a lot of sense if you think about it, given Golden's adoration of Lord of the Rings, and this might have actually played a part in his initial perception of and interest in doing the series. Due to the massive scope of what Bill Mantlo was attempting to create, and because Mantlo didn't necessarily have all the little bits and pieces worked out, Golden says that the series was written employing the Marvel method, however. That when the decision to wrap up the first arc with issue 12 was made, Michael Golden, as a result of Bill Mantlo having no actual end in mind, and especially nothing that they could work towards in 12 issues, was forced to help come up with a conclusion to the whole Baron Karza arc for the 12th issue. Mantlo, on the other hand, contends that not only was the story always intended to be a 12-issue story arc, but that it was meticulously scripted and planned from the start. Considering Golden flipped script and dropped the series after he found out about the Man-Thing and Captain Universe stories, though, I highly doubt this is the case, but I know Michael Golden had grown tired of Micronauts regardless and was basically looking for a reason to leave or maybe even get kicked off the series by this point. So I guess you never really know for sure. Regardless, at 12 issues, Micronauts would prove to be one of the longest runs that Golden would ever undertake in the comics field. Despite the fact he'd walked away after only a year, Micronauts was blowing up and Michael Golden found himself in a new and interesting position as a result. While he'd never been super interested in the field, once he started earning some acclaim and garnering fan interest, Golden began attending comic book conventions. He said since that this period and the attention that he received during it is the reason he refused to attend conventions for almost two decades following. No, he didn't have a run-in with some crazy fan or anything like that, but apparently it was his own behavior as well as the way that he was treated that so deeply affected Michael Golden. While he finds conventions themselves somewhat embarrassing today, years later he would recall that early on he let all the attention go to his head in a major way and that he was, quote, pretty much an asshole about it. Quote, I definitely got suckered into it, but I realized I didn't like what I was getting pulled into. My feeling is you either wade right into it and really enjoy it, or like me, you say, this isn't part of my job and quit going. And quit going, he did. While frustrating for fans of his work, much of where Michael Golden got in the industry was achieved because he was willing to do what others weren't. He would pack up his bags and go home if he didn't like the way that the situation was playing out. While some people see this as something of a childish response, and in some cases it might be, this has also proven to be one of Golden's greatest strengths and something that afforded him an amount of leverage that few other artists ever enjoy in the industry. Disgusted by this whole thing, Michael Golden didn't just end up quitting going to conventions or take a break from interiors. His experiences with Marvel had been so unpleasant that following his departure from Micronauts in December of 1979, following issue 12, Golden actually decided to step back from the industry almost entirely in order to concentrate on commercial work where he was happier and making a much better living at the time. Commercial art paid better, and it kept Michael Golden busy, and by all accounts, he had basically thought his career doing comics was over after he left Micronauts. This apparently, however, did not stop several of his former editors from constantly calling and asking if he wanted any assignments, namely 
Al Milgram and Larry Hama, who between the two of them are probably basically responsible for like 90% or more of the published comic book material that we've seen from Michael Golden over the years and for keeping him in the game more than anyone else on the planet for quite literally decades at this point. Golden would constantly tell Milgram and Hama that he didn't have time to do anything, but he still said that he somehow found himself getting talked into short 8-10 to 10 page stories by Milgram and Hama here and there, as well as quickly settling not so comfortably into a long career as one of the preeminent cover artists of the 1980s in almost no time at all. In fact, as disillusioned with the Micronauts that he had become, even after stepping back from interiors, Michael Golden would continue to provide covers for the series for the next several years on top of a host of other books, mostly due to fan demand. Again, most of this work was for Marvel during the next few years, as I think Al Milgram and Larry Hama were about the only guys capable of getting Michael Golden to do work during this time, although Golden did do a handful of stories for Joel Orlando over at DC, who had given him some of his very first assignments in the industry as well. As he settled into his role as a cover artist, while the pay had to be comparatively much better and the deadlines much easier to meet, Golden wasn't necessarily thrilled with the new position. Golden constantly says that the major reason that he continues to work with and be interested in comics in general is storytelling. Storytelling is interesting and engaging for him and it requires something of Golden. He's more naturally gifted at design, which is a large part of covers and why he did so well as a cover artist, but that's not where his heart lies, and it's almost impossible to tell an interesting and engaging story with a cover, although Michael Golden most certainly pushes this to its limits. For Golden, there's no real story that you can sequentially tell in a single image like a cover that involves characters and emotional impact, rendering the art rather boring and moot to him in many regards. While he's obviously able to design a cover extremely well, Golden refers to it as being as interesting as, quote, designing a soup can label. As a result, Michael Golden always found himself somewhat uninterested in his cover work, despite how in demand that he has always been, as well as the amount of covers that he would end up producing over the next 30 plus years. It was during this time that Michael Golden entirely quit attending comic book conventions and all but entirely cut himself off from the industry in general, eschewing what he refers to as the cult of personality and deification of comic book artists by fans, which makes him so uncomfortable for a much quieter and more comfortable life as a more anonymous commercial artist. When dealing with the industry, Golden would avoid the spotlight and remain mostly in the background for the foreseeable future, preferring to let his work speak for itself, eventually even earning the nickname The Reclusive One. While he was stepping back from the industry in a pretty major way when it came to interiors by the end of 1979 already, one of Golden's best remembered stories, Writers in the Void, actually ended up seeing print not long after this in Star Wars issue 38, released in August of 1980. Writers in the Void had actually been the science fiction story that Golden pitched to Archie Goodwin, which had inadvertently gotten Jim Shooter's attention and his foot in the door at Marvel to begin with. Archie Goodwin had liked the story but had no idea where to put it at the time other than a Star Wars book since Marvel didn't really have any other science fiction books to speak of. Agreeing that this would work, Golden took the story and tweaked it a little bit, turning the main characters into Luke and Leia and reworking the setting a little bit, and Golden had actually finished the pencils and turned these in not inordinately long after their initial conversation, but as was all too often the case, for one reason or another, when Michael Golden would actually get something done, it would just end up sitting in a freaking drawer somewhere where it would end up languishing half-forgotten for months and sometimes even years. 
In the case of Riders in the Void, it wasn't until more than a year later in 1980 when there was a contractual dispute surrounding the licensing for the story from the Empire Strikes Back movie that Goodwin decided to pull the story out of inventory and finally get it into print and to do this as soon as he possibly could. Originally, Golden had planned to ink Riders in the Void himself, but because of deadline problems that arose due to the urgency with which Marvel needed a Star Wars story while they sorted out the contractual mess that they were involved in, Archie Goodwin had decided to call Terry Austin up to ink the story in his place and allow Golden to do color guides himself instead, which he reportedly did in two days, I might add. It did not take long for writers in the void to see print once it was pulled out of inventory and they started actually working on it and Archie Goodwin didn't take much longer with the dialogue than Golden did with the color guides for most accounts, banging it out in a matter of only a few days. Considering his remarks about inkers, while Michael Golden wasn't necessarily super pleased with the inking job, he is always happy when he gets to color himself, and he seems to be relatively pleased with how the entire thing eventually came out, despite it sitting in a drawer for an inordinate amount of time for no good reason as per usual. Widely regarded as one of the strongest issues from the Marvel Star Wars run, Riders in the Void is still fondly remembered by not only Michael Golden fans, but Star Wars enthusiasts as well, despite it being completely non-canonical. One thing that didn't end up sitting in a drawer, but had no shortage of strangeness surrounding it regardless, would be Golden's next pivotal work though, a book that would go on to have long-standing repercussions for Marvel, and in particular, the X-Men. After a well-received Doctor Strange backup some months earlier in April of 1981, Golden unleashed what is widely considered one of the greatest artistic achievements in comic books ever. Avengers Annual 10 on the world, introducing fans to his and Chris Claremont's co-creation, the malicious mutant known as Rogue for the first time in the process, only a few months later in November of that same year. While Rogue is widely considered one of the most important members of the X-Men today, and she's gone on to become an extremely important character over the years, What's really funny about Avengers Annual 10 is that despite both Michael Golden and Chris Claremont's involvement, the book had very few reasons that it should have done well and so many that it should have failed. Join me next week as we talk about Avengers Annual 10, the creation of Rogue, and so much more. But for now, I hope you all enjoyed, maybe even learned something. If you did like what you saw, make sure you hit that like button. Think about getting in the comments section below and letting me know. If you really enjoyed what you saw, make sure you Hulk smash that subscribe button. If you feel like you're in a position to help the channel grow, think about using the link in the description below to sign up for my Patreon page. Remember, donations and subscriptions make future episodes possible. For as little as $3 a month, you get access to behind-the-scenes posts early access to scripts and audio for episodes before they're ever uploaded anywhere else and you can even get your name in the credits. If Patreon is not your thing but you still want to support the channel, have no fear. You can sign up for membership right here on YouTube and get access to the scripts and the audio as well. If that's not enough, you can even pick up your very own jerk comic shirts like the ones you see on the screen now. As always, this has been a product of the Jerk Broadcasting System and brought to you by generous grants from the viewers you see on the screen now. I'd like to personally thank my loyal Wednesday Warriors as well as all of the members that you see on the screen for making this series possible. I know it took me a while to get this one done, but I hope it's worth it and I cannot wait for you all to see the rest of this series. Thanks again for sticking with me and as always, I really truly and honestly ask only two things. Keep hitting those local shops and keep reading comics.